Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming and supporting the festival and supporting Brian and his premiere of this fabulous film. The film has such heart, the director has such heart, and we are just delighted to be able to present him with the AIFF Jury Award for Best Documentary 2012, Brian. And now to lead our panel discussion, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Larry Gannon. Larry is an accomplished athlete himself and is a seasoned business professional who's worked with leading edge corporations on extreme outdoor adventure challenges and world-class world events. He motivates audiences by sharing his experiences, successes, and passion for life. Larry offers clear tactics and strategies on how to achieve goals, solve problems, overcome challenges, and deliver measurable results for organizations and individuals looking to realize their full potential. Thanks very much, Larry. Take it away. Thank you very much. All right, I know most of you, or all of you, are runners, right? So how many of you want to go out and run right now? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. All right, so I know we have about an hour of time, so, and I've got a list of questions, a bunch of questions for our panel. Um, I do want to see if we can get some audience participation as well, so can you show me your hands if you wanted to ask questions so I get a sense of timing? All right, great. Okay, fantastic. I can see most of you. All right, so, need these. So the, the film has tremendous amount of passion, tremendous amount of heart, and there's all kinds of challenges. And Brian, I'm gonna direct the first question right to you, is that, you know, so all the courage the boys showed through the adversity and through their competition, you know, I'm sure there's a lot that was said on the film, but there's probably a lot more that wasn't said on the film that maybe you can share <laughs> with us. Yeah, well, uh, my editor, uh, Sean, can attest to the fact that it was, it was actually incredibly difficult to bring it down to these five boys. Uh, you know, we had seven boys for a long time in the film, and we were really, really trying to push for all of them. And even that, you know, was kind of difficult. Uh, I was, I was blessed with a lot of a lot of really good kids on, on both of these teams. Uh, you know, who all had very different stories, um, facing very different challenges, but you know, all succeeding in their own way. So, um, yeah, it was you know, it was painful, but I think that these five boys. Um, they, you know, they all showed tremendous courage and in what they shared with me, um, and uh, and I think also in uh, what they accomplished. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I have to. There's uh, unfortunately there's not a lot of uh, dialogue that tends to take place on the reservation, um, even within families. Uh, it's. Um, you know, there just is just not this culture of, of sort of openly sharing and discussing problems. And uh, I was, uh, you know, and I think after a certain period of time, um, once they, you know, felt comfortable with me and they, they understood what I was, you know, what I was there for, that I was serious about uh, following them, and, and I had built some trust with them, you know, they, um, I, I really didn't have to say much in a lot of these interviews. I actually didn't ask all that many questions. I think they, you know, sometimes just asking about their family, uh, just, you know, they, they opened up and they, and they started sharing, you know, stories uh, more often than not uh, about their fathers. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in many cases, not easy stories to tell. But it really, you know, what it said to me was that these guys, had a lot that they needed to share, you know, a lot that they really needed to talk about and didn't have an opportunity to talk about. And I really don't think people even ask them, you know, a lot of times, simple questions like, you know, what's, right. how are you doing? How are you, how are things with your, with your parents, with your father, you know, whatever. So, 
Um, you know, so I, <laughs> in many ways, it was just a matter of, uh, you know, I think once, once I had built that, that trust and, and friendship with them, um, you know, it was, they, they wanted to share this stuff. And, and uh, you know, there was a moment of hesitation even toward the end of the, of the project when I first started putting, you know, a trailer online and I still felt, you know, I was trying to be protective of them, I think, and, and I actually emailed Dennis and Johnny and I said, hey, you know, look, guys, you know, you're, the, you're in the final film and, and so there's a trailer and there's some stuff that's, you know, difficult stuff that you told me about your dad or whoever. And, um, uh, you know, and both Dennis and Johnny emailed me right back and they said, look, we shared that stuff with you for a reason. We want people, you know, it's a, I want people to know what's, I want people to know my story. And, and um, you know, a tremendous, uh, tremendously mature, uh, you know, attitude from these, uh, from these boys. So, thanks. Was, yeah. Thanks. So, Carl, I, 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 coach, I was going to go to you next. I was going, you've worked with the boys, so give us some insight. Yeah, as, as a, uh, it, it was very different to watch it as an outside observer uh, here tonight. But uh, there, there were quite a few things from, from small to, to big that, uh, that Brian did have to cut out. Uh, you know, when they were 15 minutes late for practice, that was because they opened a brand new Taco Bell. <laughs> and, uh, we're often dollar tacos, and uh, there were other the the part of why Johnny uh, passed out at the finish and, and was stumbling, and uh, Ryan only ran as fast as he did as a sophomore is, uh, I don't know how many of you traveled to Phoenix, but uh, at this time of year you can have dramatic uh, temperature fluctuations, and uh, we raced at two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I think it might be in the sixties in the uh, in the morning, but it was well into the 90s. I think it might have been a record-setting day that day. And uh, there was a girls' race right before our race, and there was a horrible injury right at the finish line. And they held these guys at the starting line for a good 20, 30 minutes. And they, you can imagine how nervous you are before the state championship meet. And uh, you're, you're sweating like crazy already. And the, the, uh, the starter just had them doing stride out after stride out. And by the time they started, they were exhausted. Uh, but there were other issues as well, and, and issues that I wasn't even aware of when uh, they were going on. I mean, Brian, you saw a lot of, he, he was going through some emotional challenges. And at the time, I really thought it was all about uh, him becoming the, the number two runner on the team. He, uh, I, I, I couldn't even tell you offhand how many state titles he had won, but he began winning state championships as a sophomore. And, uh, as a junior, he won every single title there was to win, and then um, and Billy was right on his on his heels, and uh, coming second to Ryan his entire uh, sophomore year. This the the, the year um, if you didn't pick up my Ryan's senior year and Billy's junior year and uh, Dennis's junior year was was pictured here. Uh, but what was also going on is uh, you know, Ryan, as you know, lost his dad before high school started, but his mom is, uh, was having some. Some difficulties, and uh, Ryan and his sister April, who uh, was uh, Dennis's girlfriend in the film, uh, they were essentially on their own. Their uh, Ryan's grandparents lived in a trailer nearby, but uh, the two of them were on their own, and I had no idea while the, this film was being made. And uh, so he was going through a lot more than than I knew at the time. Thanks, Coach. So I'm gonna. <coughs> The, the film opens up with this cultural aspect, this introduction of the Hopi and Navajo traditions and the culture of running. Christopher McDougall wrote a fantastic, outrageously fantastic book, Born to Run, and you deal with that culture in the book. Do you have your perspective both on the film and how it relates to the culture that's presented? You know, I was, when I first became aware of Brian's film, I was uh, supposed to be writing a new book of my own, and I saw the trailer. And I immediately thought, fuck this, man. I just want to <laughs> spend my time watching this film. I completely forgot what I was working on. <laughs> and I think the next two days doing nothing but promoting uh, Brian's movie. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> completely generous. It just I just sent him an email out of the blue. <laughs> it just seemed way better than anything I was doing. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Delilah, for, for introducing that word to your vocabulary, which you were not supposed to learn for three more years. <laughs> So here's a story that, I, that it came to mind when I saw the trailer. 
when I was working on Born to Run, I came across some information about uh, the Hopi and Navajo running traditions. And I thought, that's be kind of cool to see if there's any sort of cross-border connection between the, what the Hopi are doing now and what the Tatamata have always done. And through one connection or the other, I tracked down a guy named uh, Bucky Preston. Did you ever run across Bucky Preston, by the way? So li- li- I, I heard his name all the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to talk to Bucky Preston. And I don't know how I tra- and tracking him down was kind of cool because he lives on the Hopi Reservation. And I, you know, who do you call on the Hopi Reservation? You know, <laughs> hello, Hopi Reservation. You got Bucky for me. But it was sort of like that. I kind of called some random number, like, yeah, we know Bucky. And, and they sort of passed the word around. And one day, out of the blue, I think I called like some like municipal building and left them a message. And they got a call back from Bucky. And he and I would talk on the phone periodically while I tried to set up, set up a visit down there. And he would just tell these like, wild, outrageous stories about when he was a kid and they would run from the reservation down to watch the trains. I'm like, oh, where was that? Oh, I was like 70 miles away. <laughs> They'd run down, watch the train, and then run back. 140 mile a day, just watch a train go by. <laughs> so um, he said, but the guy you want to talk to is Dennis Puheku. And he gave me another phone number for this guy, Dennis. And so I set this trip where I would go down and meet up with Dennis, and Dennis would take me out to, to the Hopi Reservation. And we go for this run. As I'm driving down there, some dude smacked my car. The bumper's falling off. I had to tie on my shoelaces. I'm running late. I pick up Dennis. I'm, I'm sort of frazzled and harassed. And we finally get to the Hopi Reservation. And we go off for this run. And finally, all the stresses of that day and trying to set this trip up start to melt away because we're up on top of this mesa. And it's gorgeous. And the sun's going down. And I'm hearing coyotes. And it's getting darker. And Dennis goes, Oh shit, I'm not really sure where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're a fucking Hopi! <laughs> Can't you like, read some sand or something? You know? <laughs> and he's like, well, actually, no, uh, I didn't grow up on the reservation. <laughs> not the time to find this out. <laughs> and he told me his story, and his story was, and the reason why he knew Bucky was because uh, Dennis had left the reservation as a very little boy and grown up off the reservation, you know, growing up in some like suburb of like Tucson. And it was only in middle age when he was in his 30s that he was in the middle of a really painful divorce and having, you know, what the term is like intrusive thoughts. You know, things were going south badly for Dennis at this point in his life. And somehow he got the inclination just to go back to the reservation and just talk to people or just sort of see what's going on. Maybe he could start a new life back there. And he bumps into Bucky who is uh, one of the Hopi elders. And Bucky sits down with him and says, you just need to get back to running, man. You just need to do some <laughs> running. And this is a guy who never ran a step in his life. So he started to do these, these long runs with, with Bucky, just to, just to train and, and get back in that Hopi tradition of running. He's still living out in the suburbs. And one day he wakes up and he has this idea. He's like, I'm just going to run and just visit all my family back on the reservation. So he calls Bucky up and he says, I'm going to leave the house. I'm going to run back to the reservation. I'm going to go see my grandmother and go see my uncle and go see my cousin. And he starts to run. And I think it's 50 miles just to get to the reservation. And then he stops off at the first house. If everyone's waiting for him, he comes inside. They're feeding him, giving him stuff. And then he goes to run like 10 miles to the next house. And a bunch of people in the house like came with him, like the cousins came with him. <laughs> and they ran to the next house. And everyone's out there waiting to greet him. And all the relatives are there. And they bring him inside. Everyone's hugging him. Everyone's getting very emotional. And then people from that house go with him as well. So it becomes this clan gathering of a guy who had left the reservation 30-some years ago. And the more he ran, the more the clan came with him. So by the time he got to the final house, his whole family's there with him. So I just heard the story. Thought, Man, it's just the greatest story I've ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm. And I was desperate to get this story into Born and Run. To this, to this day, I keep thinking about this guy who had been lost, you know? It's almost like a biblical story. And he comes back, and the family gets bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger the more and more he runs. Unfortunately, if you read Born to Run, there are so many bizarre, I'm, I'm in 1950s Czechoslovakia in this book, and I'm supposed to be in 2005 Mexico. There are enough tangents and detours, I just could not shoehorn this one last episode in, so it ended up on the cutting room floor. But um, when I saw what Brian was doing, I thought, man, there is something going on down there in Arizona <laughs> that the people need to see and realize. And I was going to take one moment out. When I saw the film, I kept thinking, it's really about these guys, these two coaches. And I saw it again tonight. Right? And 
what they did was absolutely masterful about inspiring these guys and goading them on and reading their minds and understanding what was going on inside those, those silent adolescent heads. Uh, I just thought it was, it was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Thanks.